Okay, so the uh, the recording has has started. So today I'm going to share the story of my dad and the impact and, and influence he had on me uh, growing up. I initially thought that my awakening and the journey really began when actually when I took an eighth of mushrooms and I was like 16 and had a horrible initiation into a very underworld type experience. And I thought for a long time, that was the uh, beginning of, of spirituality for me because it was such a, a strange and shocking experience. It really shook my whole view and version of reality to the core. Before that night, I was an atheist after that night, I wasn't. So for a long time, that's when it began. And um, I had gone to Thailand after that. Like uh, that experience happened when I was 16. I did my first 10 day Vipassana retreat, which was a silent meditation retreat. I did that as soon as I turned 18. And then a year after that, I did my first three month meditation retreat in Thailand. And I thought for a long time, that's when, that's when things really started, but uh, the path for me really began with my dad. So my mom is from Thailand. Uh, my dad is from, he grew up in the suburbs in Iowa city in the he was born in 61, so he was a 70s kid, and I was born in 92. My parents met working at a, uh, at a hospital here in Los Angeles, so my dad was a respiratory therapist. That's a kind of medical uh, worker who helps intubate a person and just deals with respiratory functions, and my mom was an EKG technician, and apparently the story goes that uh, they were just co-workers for five years and they they didn't date or anything but um, my dad just asked her to uh, to marry him he understood Asian culture he's a really smart guy so he just went and asked my my mom's mother my grandma uh, if uh, for permission to to marry her and that was the the beginning of their of their relationship uh, I was I was born a uh, a year after that, so all of this happened in the in the late eighties, and yeah, I had a normal, pretty normal upbringing. I mean, there was a lot of kids in the house, so when my dad married my mom, he 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 married her whole family, <laughs> so all living together in Los Angeles. You know, this this white guy with like a whole you know my mom, my aunt, her brother, my grandma. Uh, and my uncle's girlfriend at the time, they were all, they were all together. So I grew up with, um, with their kids too, all my cousins. So our house for the first like 10 years of my life was just full of people is three cousins and, and my sister. So I had a really fun upbringing and childhood. I spent a lot of time just outside playing with my sister and and my cousins every day. And when I was 10 years old, um, I was going through my my dad's stuff. So when I was a when I was a boy, I was a kind of I was a kleptomaniac. So I just stole anything I could get my hands on. I was like always going through drawers, looking through stuff for no reason. And I was going through my my dad's stuff he had this this kind of like shed workhouse that he used to spend a lot of his time in and I was like just rummaging through things as usual and I opened a drawer and I see this like a sea of blackened glass pipes and I didn't know what it was. I was only I was only 10, but I could feel this darkness from them or I just had this really sense that what I had stumbled into 
what I had found was bad. And I just looked at, at all the pipes for a second and, and stared at it. And I started sifting through the pipes and underneath all the pipes, I found a picture of me in, in first grade, a class picture. And I held that picture up and that was the first time in my life that my heart broke. So I knew in that moment that there was something wrong with him or that he wasn't like other, he wasn't like other dads. Something was off. So that was a very intuitive moment. And it was the, it was really the first moment I suffered that I truly suffered uh, was that, that day uh, holding that picture. So as I, as I grew up and uh, got older, it became more apparent that he had a, he had a very serious drug problem. So my dad was a really nice guy, actually. Um, he never laid a hand on me and was a really stable person, like a super high functioning addict. Um, his specific job was neonatal resuscitation. So he would take a premature baby and intubate it, have to put a tiny breathing tube into its lungs. So he was extremely skilled and refined um, at his work. Um, but he had some sad things that happened to him when he was a kid. And I, I think it hurt him very, very intensely. And so he just had to deal with that for the rest of his life. And I think it, that's what made him turn to, uh, to drugs. Well, I mean, we all did drugs, right? But I think my dad probably did a little more cocaine than, uh, than people expected he would do. And that started in high school. And then you know, coming out to Los Angeles, crack was really big at the time. So he got into crack. And then meth hit the, hit the, um, hit Los Angeles and he used meth for as long, as long as I could remember <clears throat> it was meth. So, you know, seeing how this affected my, my family, you know, there'd be times where, uh, his like work was inconsistent. So like the water would be shut off or something or the power, there wouldn't be heat, there wouldn't be hot water or no internet, just like stuff that just pissed me off so much as a kid. Like I was so angry at him that like my friends got to go to, you know, their dads got to take them to the Grand Canyon and, you know, their dads would take them on trips and do all this like family stuff right I didn't, I didn't have any family stuff I had like pretending to be a family stuff <laughs> which was like an occasional last minute trip and drive to to the redwoods like totally on a whim my dad was always like this okay we're we're getting in the van we're going we're going to uh, to northern California like completely last minute never planned anything ever <laughs> so um yeah, but as a teenager, I was I was really I was really upset that he wasn't as involved in in my life as I as I wanted him to be. And that anger in me just just grew and grew and and grew. And um, my dad would always tell me his stories of like getting high out of his mind in the 70s. So I had no reservations about using tons of drugs uh, myself. I sold at one point. And that's when I really started to get into, into trouble. Um, yeah, I was arrested a few times. Almost went to, almost went to juvenile hall after violating probation. But um, I had really good grades. <laughs> So my case was dismissed uh, in, uh, in, my, in my junior year of high school. I went to a high school called Granada, Granada Hills Charter High School. It's actually one of the better high schools in the country. Um, they had a really good academic decathlon team. And 
you know, I just couldn't get this, couldn't, couldn't, just could not get a handle on Spanish or any foreign language. So in my junior year, I was the only junior in Spanish. And this is the second time I'd taken it, took Spanish in, in ninth grade, took, Span took sign language in 10th grade because I failed Spanish in ninth grade. And then I failed sign language in 10th grade. So I, I ended up in Spanish again. And uh, yeah, I failed it again. So the, the, after I failed the first semester of Spanish, I was no longer qualified to graduate high school in, at that school. So I had to drop out of high school. And I, I entered some like continuation high school where all the drug addicts and kids that got kicked out of school go to. So I went there. And I, I remember asking my dad, I was like, dad, I need you to pull me out of, out of Granada. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Why would I ever do that? It's a great school. And then I said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to graduate. Like, I'm not going to walk, walk the stage because I, I couldn't pass Spanish. And he's like, really? I was like, yeah. He's like, Jesus. <laughs> so he pulls, so he, he pulls me out of the school like the next week. And I start, you know, the continuation school, which, which I did okay at, you know, but I did really good there. But of course you did good there. It's a school for where all the vagrants and dropouts go. So it's like super easy. So I went there and I, I finished high school up there. Um, but yeah, the, the, <clears throat> the anger, uh, it really became like a, a source of separation. So I, I let that, I let that get between us. And I remember there were, there was a year where there was a year where living in the same house, we said no more than five words to each other. I was so mad, so mad uh, that that's, that's all the contact I had. And it's because half the time he was sleeping because he's on a meth, he was coming down from a meth binge. And then the other half of the time he's on meth, you know, in the, in the shed that he used to spend all of his time in. So, you know, I just drank, smoked and fucked my youth away in high school. That's all that I did. I didn't really care about anything else. Um, until I had that shroom trip and it radically altered my perception of, of reality. I wrote about it on on, on Instagram, actually, it's called Enter the Shadow. It was, if it, it literally just terrified me. I didn't know that a spiritual devil existed or that a spiritual reality existed at all. And when I took uh, those, those mushrooms alone, I looked into a mirror and the spiritual dimension became a very extremely terrifying and real place within seconds. And, um, after that, I just concluded, I was like, okay, any, any source of negativity in my life has to be taken care of now. Not going to wait till tomorrow. Not going to wait until I get jumped or stabbed or I end up in jail. I need to stop everything that I'm doing right now. Can't, can't sell even another gram of pot. Done. It's over. So that's what I did. I just gave everything away and and I stopped and that was the beginning of my my interest in in spirituality I'd always been like philosophically minded but specifically about spirituality I, I didn't really wasn't really open to it until then so I started with that and um a few months after that my mom invited me on my first meditation retreat so at this time, I'm still, I think I'm still 16, maybe I'm 17. I'm not sure. But she invites me on this retreat. My mom was obviously dealing with this very difficult situation for years at this point, for 15 years at this point. They stayed together all the way until he passed away. So she was watching this. Uh, there used to be this Thai 
Buddhist TV channel that my temple, um, my temple, I think for a long time was only the, the only Buddhist temple that had a channel like on a satellite channel in space on TV. And um, so she saw, she saw all these monks and all these, all this meditation stuff on this channel. And they were advertising on the channel that there was a meditation retreat that they were doing or that they were hosting in uh, Southern California through one of their satellite branches. And my mom was very excited because after tuning into this channel and practicing Dhammakaya meditation, it was the first time she felt peace and relief in years. Um, so she sees this advertisement and she just begs me, hey, let's go do this meditation retreat together. And uh, I said, sure, okay, let's go. So we went and the first two days, it was taught by monks and it was a retreat of probably like 15 people. And it, they rented out a Catholic uh, monastery in San Dimas in Southern California. They rented it for the weekend. So we did the retreat there. And the first two days, total monkey mind wandering mind i was i was even getting angry because i just couldn't couldn't calm down couldn't come to stillness and on the third day in the evening session so it was like one of the last sits of the whole meditation retreat i was sitting there one moment and the next moment i have this experience of it wasn't a out of body experience, but I had this sense that I was floating, like I was floating from my chair up and up into the sky and really having a sense that I was floating off of the ground and, and through the ceiling. And I thought, wow, this is unusual. And eventually I was, I'd floated so far up that I felt like I was resting in these clouds. And there was this, this was all happening in my um, mind's eye but it was very real. And this light broke through the clouds. I was just enveloped in this like golden warmth and, and love and peace. And I'd never felt anything like that before. And it was such a beautiful experience. Maybe it only lasted a, a few minutes. And then I like sunk down, floated down back to my back to my seat and back to the back to the ground but it was enough to um, really spark my interest in in meditation so a year after that I turned 18 I do a 10-day Vipassana retreat that was mind-blowing uh, a year after that did my first three-month meditation retreat and at the time I was in community college and you know working as a waiter and stuff and my dad was still alive and I was still living with um mom and dad at the time so that retreat was super difficult I mean I, I thought the 10 day was hard because you have to be silent and it's very painful at least the way that Goenka teaches and the Vipassana tradition uh, after like the second day you're instructed not to move for an entire hour three times a day and to really just observe the pain that's arising. And I mean, this is just excruciating pain. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I got through it. And on Thailand, in Thailand, I, w I went and did, a, did the retreat there. It was like a three month retreat and teacher certification program that a branch or that a department of the temple was doing at the time. And I thought that, you know, I was going to attain all these incredible states and have superpowers at the end of it and like get enlightened at the end of the hundred days and like complete opposite. It was a total shit show. Couldn't follow instructions. Absolute just torture. Just a torturous retreat. The whole time it was torturous. I, I became best friends with the best meditator on the retreat. And I mean, this guy... I've never seen a guy like this. I just watched him sit for six hours, eight hours without moving a muscle, no movement. He would just sit there 
forever. And he was only a couple years older than me. He was an Indian kid. His dad was a monk. So he started meditating when he was like 10. I've been meditating for 12 years. I still can't do that, you know? And I just watched this man just sitting forever without moving a muscle. And, oh, oh, God. <laughs> so much jealousy. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the suffering that having to sit next to this guy and get to know him caused me was so strong. You know, my, my ego is so big after some of those early meditation retreats and, and out of body experiences, you know, I, I thought, I thought I was special for sure. And then I come and sit next to this guy. He just like, just, just the best meditator I've ever seen. You know, none of, not even the monks could sit like this guy. They would talk about him in Thai at lunch and say, he's, he's one of the best in the entire temple, in the entire community. He's, he's here. He's the one of the best. And, um, yeah, so I became very good friends with him and, and very close with him. Um, but the retreat was supposed to be this, like, you know, relaxing, peaceful, letting go, tranquil, happy, blissful, just just vanished into samadhi out of the, the flow of the practice. And it was just total craving and clinging the entire time, 90 days straight of craving. It's absolute. Just immense craving and uh and the retreat ended and uh i i didn't attain you know jhana or samadhi or anything like that so i was horribly distraught oh so sad <laughs> it's like i failed <laughs> absolutely failed and so after that I, I i hung around thailand for a month and uh, just traveled around with some family friends came back to the US uh, for a few months. And then my grandma unexpectedly over the summer went back, wanted to go back to Thailand. Her sister uh, had fallen ill. So that's what we did, or I went with her. So went to Thailand uh, for the second time that year. Um, and sorry. The cat's not in here, right? Oh, you're good, because sometimes it meows too loud. Um, anyway. So Thailand, round two. I'm there for a couple of weeks. Grandma's sister passes away. And uh, after that, I decide that I wanted to stay in uh, Myanmar and just uh, meditate there for like six months. Um, I decided at that point that I wanted to stay in, in Southeast Asia and really just master meditation and, and learn it to the best of my, best of my ability. So my grandma goes back to the U S I go, I go to Burma and I stay at the, uh, at Pandita Rama, which is the Mahasi Sayadaw center. So Mahasi Sayadaw is like probably the most popular meditation teacher out of Burma or besides Goenka. And uh, he died decades and decades ago, but his students still run that place. And the way that they practice is they do everything in slow motion. Everything in slow motion. So for like three weeks, I, I moved like this. This is how I ate. drinking water like that so when you do that in their tradition it, it makes your concentration and your mindfulness very very strong because you're slowing down and you don't have any distractions you sit for an hour and then you walk and you do that for like 14 hours a day so that was the training that I did and like three weeks into the retreat and by, mind you I got like a special visa to stay here so I couldn't, um, I had no intention to leave. Uh, I had to go through some hoops to get through that, to get that visa. I had to get it, you know, approved in Thailand, all of that. And uh, it was, it allowed me to stay there for six months. And so I could do the winter retreat that I signed up for. So they do a 60 day retreat every winter. 
I got there in September. I was just going to meditate until the winter retreat. And then after that, those 60 days, I was going to figure out what I wanted to do, whether I wanted to stay there or go back to Dhammakaya in Thailand. So it's the third week of the retreat. And I just get this really strange impulse and this extremely persistent voice saying, you need to leave, get out of here, get out of this place. Now you need to go get out of here. And I'm like, what is this? You know, I just got a visa to stay here. This makes no sense. It makes no sense for me to leave the winter. I, I plan to do the winter retreat. Why would I leave? But it was so persistent. It was literally like, like this person was whispering in my ear, in my mind, saying that you have to leave. And it lasted like eight hours. So the next day, I just told them, hey, I, I need to go. I follow my intuition. And uh, they said, that's strange. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll get you a, a taxi back to the airport. So... Uh, and staying in that monastery, you have to give them your phone and they put it in a locker. And like, you can check your emails like once a month. But besides that, you have no phone. You have no contact with the outside world whatsoever. So it's literally in a temple in the jungle. And this voice tells me, leave. I get on, I get in the taxi, get on the plane, go back to Thailand, open up a laptop. When a family friend picks me up, takes me back to his place. And I had a message from my best friend and the message was very recent. It, it, the message came within minutes and the message said, uh, Ryan, uh, your dad fell into a coma and he's in the hospital. You should probably come home. So fortunately my, my family friend just, it's like an uncle. He just bought me a, a ticket home, a one-way ticket home. And I came home and I think in the moment that I opened that laptop, like the shock already happened because as soon as I read it, I knew it was like, it's, it's, it's over, you know, this, this is done. And my, you know, my uncle and my family friends like, oh, he's going to be fine. He's going to be okay. You know, it, it's, everything's going to be okay. And I was like, no, it's not going to be okay. It's, it's over. I just knew. I just knew that it was the end of his life and I got here and I was still in shock. Like I couldn't, I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't really, I couldn't really feel anything for months actually um, from the moment that I read that message. So, you know, I, I, I loved my dad immensely. So when I got back and I saw him in the, in the hospital like that, and what happened was his, uh, he had asthma and then he smoked his whole life and he used meth for years, like decades. So one day, I think he was only 52. Yeah. Uh, one day he, his lungs just collapsed from the inside and he couldn't breathe. And he just stumbled out of his room. I wasn't here. My sister and my mom were, and he just fell on the floor and, you know, closed his eyes, took his, took his last breath in my, in my sister's arms which is insane. She was only 16. So, you know, the ambulance came uh, 10 minutes later or so, but by then he hadn't taken in any, any oxygen. So he was completely brain dead or like 99% brain dead. So I get there and I see my dad in the, in the hospital bed. And my dad was like, like Caucasian Neanderthal looking person, you know, like big forehead and eyebrows and huge these huge ape hands and like hair everywhere and I just saw him in the hospital room like that and fortunately the last conversation that we had before I entered the monastery uh, in Burma uh, we were talking and he's like hey so so when are you going to come home and I said I'm not coming home dad and he's like what are you talking about and I said, uh, I'm going to stay at the, at the, I'm going to stay in, in Southeast Asia in, in Burma and in Thailand. And he said, uh, how are you going to survive? And then, uh, 
I just said, like, if you do the training at the temple, they, they let you stay there, you know. You just follow their rules and they, they support you. And he said, he said, okay, well, we're going to miss you, son. And then uh, he said, let me, let me get your mom. And <laughs> wait, dad, he's like, what's up? And then I said, uh, I love you. And he said, I love you too. And that was the last, last conversation we ever had. So I come back and you know, I'm in the hospital room and the, uh, the doctor gives us the news that, you know, it's a, it's an irreversible situation. And, uh, the whole family comes in. So his dad comes in and, uh, step grandma, his mom, his, his brother, his sister, every, everyone shows up and, Yeah, even in the hospital room, like, uh, he was the donor, so he planned to donate all of his organs, but, and uh, I guess when they do the organ donation and they pull you on life support, like, you're not there, you're not present for it, because then they, I don't know, they, they start the harvesting very quickly or whatever, so we were not going to be there, but it turned out when they pulled them off life support that uh, there was still a little bit of activity in his brain. <laughs> so he just kept breathing. <laughs> he kept breathing. And they were like, oh, he's not eligible for, uh, for this anymore. Um, so we'll put him back on, on, in the, on the breathing apparatus and you can all come tomorrow and we can take him off life support again. And just wait until he stops breathing. So we do that. And my sister, you know, he, he uh, took his last breath in, in her arms. So she was just devastated. I mean, devastated. She had a special relationship with my dad because my mom favored me, you know, Asian mothers and their sons. So, so she totally favored me. And my sister knew it and my dad always uh, compensated for it. You know, he did special stuff with her, like took her to Disneyland, like wrote her letters, like spent extra time with her. Like they would always go to the movies without us and stuff without me. It would just be them too. So they had a very special relationship. They were, they were, they were close in that way. And um, yeah, so she took it really hard. And uh, the final day, we took him off life support. And he just kept breathing. And they thought that he would stop breathing like within an hour. And he's breathing like, and we're all still there like six hours later, except my sister, actually. My sister was like, oh, that's not my dad. Like, I lost my dad in my arms. Like, that's, that's not my dad. I don't want to see him. And uh, at the sixth hour, I called her. I was like, Dana, you need to come to the hospital. And she's like, I'm not going to come. I was like, Dana, come to the hospital. <laughs> Get over here now. <laughs> and and uh, so Ricardo, my best friend, takes her, who was her boyfriend at the time, uh, takes her to the hospital. And, and she walks in the room, bang, his vitals start dropping, like immediately within seconds. And within 15 minutes of her showing up, he passed away. So he was there and it's so interesting. Um, I've never seen a baby born, but I hear that the first, the first breath is an inhale. And I really saw that the final one uh, is, is an exhale. And
yeah, I remember before it happened, my, my grandpa was, was in the hall and my grandpa was a doctor and, uh, and I asked him, Hey, you know, how are you doing? And he said, uh, that's my little boy in there. Yeah, I think his parents suffered probably more than, than the rest of us did. His, uh, his mom, like, <clears throat> my grandma and my, my grandpa divorced. They split up when my, when my dad was young. And they probably hadn't hugged each other in like <laughs> four decades or something, right? And that day they, they hugged each other. Yeah, just devastating. You know, I thought the journey began when I went to Thailand and I and I did all that that meditation training. But it really began that day. That's when the training really started. Because I had this whole <clears throat> this whole vision for my life, you know, that my dad was still going to be around and that one day, you know, maybe we could become monks together and that like somehow he'd stop using drugs and that like everything would work out. Like I, I, I prayed for that. I wish that every night when I was a kid, that like he would stop using. And I, I only confronted him about it once. And um, I remember he was in a fight with my mom and bad idea to confront someone after they've just been in a fight <laughs> you know and I just told him I was like you know you know it's all you, it's all that you do right like you have a problem because like, I don't have a problem I was like you don't do anything else and he just said he just looked me dead in the face and he said I know and he walked away from me and I remember that, like, before I went to Thailand, that, that last time I told my sister, I was like, hey, we're finally going to have that, that talk with dad, you know, that, like, intervention talk where you, like, you're, like, in the movies and shit, where, like, you tell, you tell him how much you care, that you love him and that you want him to get better and all that. Yeah, we never had that talk. And all that, all that hope that I had and faith that I had and trust in the universe that I had, it all died that day. So I had a YouTube channel at the time. Uh, like the summer I turned 18, I went to, to a, I went on this crazy bike ride. <laughs> I just had this, I saw this YouTuber on YouTube and I was like, I got to beat this guy. He was talking about lucid dreaming and stuff. And he, he said he lived in Arcata and he had a lot of followers and like his lucid dreaming videos had hundreds of thousands of views. And I just had this feeling, I, like, I got to meet him. I got to meet this guy. So uh, I leave a note for my mom and dad. <laughs> just wrote a note. I left it for him. And, uh, and they said, hey, I'm going on this bike ride. <laughs> Don't call the police, please. <laughs> I'll be fine. And uh, my dad knew I could take care of myself, you know, but my mom was just like devastated over it. She's totally freaking out. And so uh, I get on a bike and I disassemble it and I put it in this cardboard box and I put, I put it on a Greyhound and I take it. I take the Greyhound from here to San Francisco, which is like um, a few hundred miles. And then from San Francisco, I assembled the bike and rode that bike all the way to the border of Oregon and California in a city called Arcata, which was where this YouTuber was. <laughs> Slept in parks on the side of roads. 
in that little, uh, the vegetation between private property and fences, you know, just like a, just totally crazy, just sleeping out in the cold like that. And uh, my dad was like, please tell me you have money. And I was like, yeah, I have some money. Don't worry. <laughs> So I make it there and the guy, the YouTuber was like, what did you just, you just biked here? And I was like, yeah, I biked here, man. He's like, you're crazy, dude. I'll start. Let's, let's do this. This is a crazy, this is a wild story. So tell your story on my YouTube channel and uh, I'll start a channel for you and you know, you'll get a couple thousand subscribers or something. So that's exactly what we did. And yeah, I had a couple thousand subscribers and I kept that channel up for like two years and it had had 200,000 views and it was it was pretty good um i had a lot of light and a lot of love and a lot of hope um that was coming through at the time you know people that was one of the characteristic qualities that i had you know people were like yeah ryan's a a really loving person and i i really got that from my dad there was a one time my dad just it was like a random Tuesday or something. And my dad just pulled me. He said, hey, Ryan. He's like, hey, come outside. I got to tell you something. So we come outside and we're sitting by the pool and, you know, he's smoking. And uh, we're just quiet at first. And, and I was like, oh, it's time for a lesson. He's going he's gonna to share some wisdom, you know. And he said, son, there's only two kinds of people in this world people who serve themselves and people who serve others. And he went on to tell me the value that he gets out of being a respiratory therapist and having, having resuscitated babies and, and save their lives. And what he shared with me there was, was what made me want to help people. I didn't know how I would do it at the time, but I just knew that when he, when he shared that, it inspired me so much that it made me want to help and my dad always got gifts and, and awards and stuff from like people that um, from work and from the parents of kids that, that he saved or that he helped. So that was really important to him. Um, later in his life, he got too sick and too, <clears throat> too just too sick to work. Um, but initially when he was, when he was younger and I was younger, um, he worked a lot. So yeah, my dad taught, my dad taught me all of that. And he was always really supportive. Um, the reason he's so important is one, one of the thing was that he never conditioned me with like any kind of view on life. He didn't instill any philosophy in me or any specific philosophy or <clears throat> worldview. He was an agnostic and that really helped me uh, significantly, drastically, because he always told me to just figure stuff for myself and come to my own conclusions and, and do my own exploration. And uh, yeah, so I didn't grow up with either like religious thinking or atheistic thinking at all. You know, it was just very, very open-minded. So that really helped. And when I started meditating and exploring spirituality, my, my dad was really supportive of it. You know, he, he just said, you know, just, just do whatever you want to do. And being Asian, you know, like all of your moms, your mom always wants you to be a doctor. <laughs> like for some reason, that's more important than being a lawyer. I don't know why being a doctor is so important to Asian mothers, but it is, they always want you to be a doctor. And uh, yeah, and it always got to me, it bothered me that like she, she tried to condition me so much like that. And I remember one day I, I asked my dad about it and I just said, uh, dad, I don't wanna be a doctor, you know? And he's like, yeah, fine, you, you know, just, you can, be, you, can be, you can be and become and do whatever you wanna be and become and do. You can be whoever, whoever you want to be, and I'll always accept you, you know, no matter what you do and, and no matter who you become. So, and one day, and one day he, he explained to me that 
that he uses as a justification for his addiction, but still a good lesson. <laughs> he said, uh, you can't live. You can't live at the whim of other people. Um, you have to do what, what you want to do. And if your life, if your life choices, uh, if the life that you live is something that other people disagree with or that they can't accept, you know, to hell with them, just do what you want to do. Probably not great advice in certain contexts, <laughs> but it made me that kind of like, like those ideas that he gave me were the reason that I put that bike in that box and I just left. You know, I, I got all of that. I got all of that, that kind of drive, just like <laughs> drive through a brick wall sort of thing. I got all that from him. You know, he was crazy in that way. Just very, he's like, yeah, if you want something, just go for it. And forget the consequences, just go for it. But I got all of that, all of that from, from my dad and he was, yeah, just so, just so supportive. I think he yelled at me like twice, you know, my whole life, which is so strange for someone that has such a serious drug problem. You would think that he'd be like beating his kids all the time and doing, doing all kinds of stuff, but he wasn't like that at all. He was actually one of the kindest, kindest, most intelligent people I knew. Like <laughs> one time I, I used to have these rabbits, you know, like kids have rabbits and stuff because <laughs> he couldn't have pets indoors like no cats or dogs he was allergic to them but rabbits were okay so we had two rabbits white rabbits i don't even remember their names but uh one day i come outside i'm like seven or something come outside and uh i see my 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 boy rabbit just like, like this on the floor you know I start screaming. <laughs> so I run inside. I get up. I'm like, Dad, Daddy's dead. He's like, he's not dead. He's just sleeping. <laughs> Comes outside. <laughs> he picks him up by the ears. He's like, he's like oh no, he's dead. <laughs> and uh, so what happened is like, I guess he, he put rat poison on the roof and then it rained and then the rat poison went onto the grass and, and the rats ate it. I mean, the rabbits ate it. And the other rabbit was was sick like you could visibly see she was just sitting there and if you try to touch her she would just scream so she was suffering from some kind of poisoning and you know at the time the parents always give you some fake story like we took him to the vet we did the best we could <laughs> uh and so that's what he told me and then we had this funeral for the rabbits and we put them in the boxes and and we buried them and you know this whole thing and and my dad told me to to hold the the shovel while while my sister and I said our last words to the rabbits, our pets. And as we were holding it, my mom and my aunt started laughing. Like while I'm saying my last words, and my dad got so mad at them. He said he just like he was like, "What are you? Stop!" And I really saw that like he, he valued life so much in that moment. He valued the, the hearts of people so much. And like many years later, you know, he told me, he told me what really happened. He's like, yeah, they, they were poisoned by the rat. They, were po they got rat poisoned. And he's like, yeah. And the, the girl, she was suffering so much. I couldn't do any, you know, I couldn't even pick her up and take her to the vet or anything. She would just scream. So, so. I just put my hands around her neck and I snapped it. It was one of the hardest things your father ever had to do. Yeah, so like little things like that. He, he was just really caring. And you know, after he he passed away, um, it was just like darkness for years. I didn't even know up from down anymore. You know, I, I had I had this vision that I was gonna go to Thailand and 
become a meditation master and live in a monastery for five years and and come back and just like change, change the world you know and uh, or 10 years or whatever however long it was how long, however long it took and yeah when he died like that I, like I had to forget about that whole thing you know my family needed me my mom, my mom needed me my sister was still in in high school she was in her senior year and my family and I we we didn't we didn't talk about it for a whole year we just like my mom wore black for for a year you know um yeah my dad always used to take her to work and so he was gone so I I had to take her to work she doesn't drive she's yeah my mom my mom never drove my dad just drove her everywhere she would like work you know a few miles away at a school so I became that person and I remember like during the before we pulled them off of life support my grandma my Thai grandma she was she was sitting in uh the living room and in in Asian families there's this or at least in Thai families there's this thing that happens when like when crisis hits like everyone goes to like the matriarch or the or the grandfather or both of them and they like get on their knees and they and they sit around them so we're all sitting around my my grandmother on our knees and we're all like this just crying and she said to me in Thai, uh, Ryan, your father is going to die, or Craig's gone now. So today you become a man. We have to endure this. That was it. <clears throat> it was just so interesting to like all be brought to our knees like that. And they, you know, she puts her, her hand on your head, puts her hands on everyone's head and holds everyone. So, Yeah, and at the at the final moment <clears throat> when he took that final exhale, what happened was like his whole face squeezed up and and he shed a tear. And then he just this like an exhale, like I've never heard an exhale like that. Just and all of the color left his face. And everyone cried except me because I just couldn't feel anything anymore and we went to the you know the funeral was a couple of days uh, after that and everyone gave their speeches and <clears throat> everyone cried grandpa cried his mother didn't even give a speech she couldn't she couldn't speak at all and uncle and brother cried <laughs> and then I gave a speech and uh I got in front of everyone and I said <clears throat> you know my dad taught me a lot of uh important lessons in life one of them was son if you're gonna lie don't get caught <laughs> He actually taught me that and uh yeah so <clears throat> but I didn't I didn't cry during my speech and I didn't cry at all for months and then just one I but I was dreaming about him every night and every night every night I would just be screaming in my dreams just like sobbing screaming and then I would wake up and feel nothing 
or I feel some emotion like coming right out of the dream state, like some tears waking up. But then after that, just nothing, just numbness. And then one morning, um, I just woke up like four months later, three months later or something. And it was like, my heart just cracked. And I just cried, like break down you know, for like two hours. Just couldn't stop, just couldn't stop crying. And yeah, so I had to try to like figure my life out. And, you know, I thought I was going to become this practitioner and like live in the forest and stuff. And everything, everything seemed to make sense when, when, when I saw life through, through that route. But after he died, like nothing made sense anymore. I didn't know what I was going to do or. Um, I, I still practiced meditation. I knew I still wanted to be a teacher at some point. And I was still, I never gave up from the path. That, that was still like the main and, and most important thing. So I did, I managed it to the best that I could, but you know, I didn't have him around. So I had to make, I had to raise myself and make a man out of myself <clears throat> and grow up myself. So when I was met with like critical situations, you know, I didn't have his like his wise eyes to be like, this is obviously stupid. You shouldn't do this, <laughs> you know? So I ended up like joining a cult, like live with the teacher, did the whole thing, you know, meditated for a year with that, with that person, got into all kinds of stupidity, you know, changed jobs every year, moved cities every year, changed girlfriends every year, just totally lost. I was so lost for a long time. I was lost for like seven years. You know, he passed away when I was 19, turning 20. I didn't, I kind of didn't get my head screwed back on until I was like 28, 27, 28. So I literally spent like the better part of a decade just completely, just so lost. And, um, yeah, 27 rolls around and uh, working as a loan officer, <laughs> some mortgage banker in Santa. Santa. And he's just like, he's like, damn, you're behind on life, man. Like you fucked up. You have nothing. You know, you're a broke, lazy ass American. Can't do shit. So these are the kind of father figures I was attracted to, you know? And so I worked with him for like 18 months or something like that. Complete waste of time. I never should have been there in the first place. Um, and, and then one day I, I get off a, I get off a plane after reading Ramana Maharshi. And uh, there was a line in the book that said, uh, liberation enlightenment is to know that you were never born. And by this point, I'm already kind of like leaving the cult that I was that I was involved in and uh yeah I read that line and something like I just could I started sweating I started trembling after I read that I didn't understand I was like what what enlightenment is to know that you were never born like what does that even mean and uh the sweating and the trembling passed and then I was still on the plane and I was driving I was driving like later that day after I, I got back to the US from having basically like said my goodbyes to the cult in China. <laughs> so so uh I'm driving and then this like the boundaries of my body, like where my demarcation line ends, you know, you have your body and then everything else, this sense that like there's internal and then that there's everything else that's external that that division just vanished while I was driving and like my heart just opened and it was like I could feel the hearts of all the people in their cars around me on the five north <laughs> you know in, in Los Angeles and uh just total dissolution of Ryan and just complete this presence like nothing I've ever known just this presence of mind just shattered, just crashed through everything. And uh, I remember like my left brain processing was kind of inhibited when this was happening. So 
I'm staring in front of the computer, like trying to process a loan application. And I'm just like, <laughs> my boss is like, what the fuck is wrong with you, man? <laughs> and then he's like mad at me and my heart's open. And I just like, I see that, I see so clearly that like all the wealth that he's accumulated is just running from the poverty of his past. And like, I love him and I accept him and I accept the situation. And uh, I was in that for like 10 days, 10 days nonstop. And that was the beginning of when the wandering ended. Um, when that sense of being lost for seven years ended, it started with that, with that, with that moment or that, that period of time. And uh, I'll wrap it up now. I went through, I should have got more therapy, you know, now that I look back, but I did see therapists and healers and, and they were so helpful and uh, just indispensable when it came to, to healing and processing, you know, this, this loss that I, that I suffered from. And uh, I think it was like two years ago. So I've had a lot of out of body experiences. So anytime I talk about out of body experiences, I preface it with, you don't have to believe anything that I'm about to say. <laughs> some of them are just very out there. And, and they are of a mystical and, and supernatural nature. So you don't have to believe it if you don't want to. I'll just tell you what happened. So um, over the years, I saw my dad out of body, mostly around the house. And like when I had seen him, the times that I, that I saw him in the early years, he really did not look good. Yeah, not look good at all. And uh I think I saw him like once in out of body experience and I'm not even sure if he knew he was dead to be honest with you yeah he seemed pretty lost but he was still here and I saw him more recently in an out of body experience probably a couple years ago and in Buddhism they have this notion that like every time you ordain or every time you meditate or every time you do something good you you dedicate that fortune and that that positive energy, that merit to the departed. So I did that for my dad over the years. And um, yeah, after the last ordination that I did, so that was like two years ago, I had an OBE here in the house. And uh, I meditated in the morning, but I got sleepy. So I just laid down. And then I laid down and I, I opened my eyes and I was like, I'm definitely not dreaming which is such a weird thing to think, you know, it's like, you're already in a, you're already in the rabbit hole at that point. So I get up and I turn around and uh, there was this elevated platform in the back of the room. That's not actually there. And it was like covered in uh, white cloth and he was sitting on it. Uh, and he was, he had these white pants, like kind of like, like sweatpants in a way. He had these like white pants and he was like shirtless and he looked so vibrant and and so young and it, he looked like he was never sick it was so strange and i saw him and i was like dad is that you and uh, he just smiled at me he just smiled and i like ran or floated over to him you know in the astral body <clears throat> i gave him a hug and there was just like this explosion of golden light and I started chanting in the astral body and I started sending him merit and, uh, and blessings and, and everything. And uh, afterwards, it, it made sense that, you know, for him and considering the life that he had and, and everything that he went through and just how much he had to suffer towards the end, like he was really sick and he was depressed and he was addicted and he couldn't be there as much as he wanted to for his kids. And his kids were angry at him for it. And <clears throat> his wife hated him and, and everyone thought he was a failure. So when I saw him in this out of body state, he just was like glowing like this angel. It, it really just showed me and it became so clear that like, for him to die like that was actually the best outcome because he was suffering so much and 
it was ultimately better for me and for my family and for everyone. Um, and it turned out the way that it did, you know, maybe it could have been less traumatic, you know, that's always helpful, but, <laughs> but either way, like the departing, um, he was eventually able to be free of the pain that I saw him in and the pain that I knew he had while, while I, while I lived with him and while I knew him, he just seemed, yeah, he's like an angel. And I was so happy for him. Yeah, so that's the story of my dad. I hope all of you enjoyed that. If you have any questions, you can ask him. I'm going to stop the recording now. Doo-doo.